Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sammy Riccio and I am the Donor Engagement Coordinator for Hawkwatch International. And I wanna welcome you to our event, Ask an Expert Live. So this presentation is gonna run for about an hour in total. Um, a lot of you already sent in questions in advance. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the questions that were sent in advance and then we're gonna pause and see if anyone who is here live has questions. And then we will continue going with some other questions that we have. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat feature throughout the whole event. Um, this presentation is free thanks to ZAP for those of you that are local to Salt Lake County and with addition, additional support from donors like you. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. We will get into it. Okay. So I'll introduce all of our experts we have today. So we have Steve Slater, our conservation science director, Jesse Watson, our research biologist and banding coordinator, and then Mike Shaw, our secretary on our board and hawk watcher and community scientist. So with that, I think we'll dive into questions. Are you guys ready? Ready as we'll ever be. Let's go. Okay. I just want to get hawk watcher added to my title true <laughs> true um yeah so before we get in actually i i lied we have an actual ask an experts form for those of you who don't know so if you go to our website on the very top we have this button right here that says ask an expert um and you can submit any id questions raptor questions in general um, and our scientists and experts will answer them for you. Um, three of them are here with us, but um, I guess, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the form and all that good stuff? Sure. So, um, where do we want to start? Steve, I liked your, your thoughts the other day that you shared. If you want to start sure. with that, I think that's a great kind of starting place. Yeah, I, I just, um, in preparation for this, just was saying that, um, we really enjoy the the diversity of questions that we get. Um, it's it's great uh, for us to keep us on our game, and we always find them really interesting. The types of questions that come in, um, you know, I, I like to say up front as a disclaimer that you know, we often maybe don't feel individually like we're experts as a team. We have some expertise, and we we definitely phone each other and discuss these things. And um, if you're getting started in Raptor ID or in Raptor behavior and just learning about birds definitely feel, um, you know, free to use the resources that are out there and don't be afraid to ask questions. And um, just like anything that you're learning to do, it requires practice. You can read forever about IDing birds in books, but until you start to, to do some of it and, and put it into practice, uh, it's hard to make those connections in the real world. And so don't be afraid to get out there and, and try to, to to put it into practice yourself. And, um, I, you know, I think also just over the years that we've been doing this, it's interesting to see the flavor questions, which some of them I'm sure will come up here, but, you know, we get a lot of what kind of bird is this um, based on, you know, photos or description. Um, and we can use basic um, things like location and habitat and so on to try to like narrow down into an educated guess and look at field marks. And so, you know, we encourage people to try to use those same types of approaches. Um, then we get a lot of questions about what to do if you find uh, an injured bird. And so we have a, a place on our website where there's great information about that um, and, and things and resources you can find if you do find an injured bird or a young bird. Um, and then we get what I really enjoy. I enjoy the ID questions, but I really enjoy the behavior questions when people have um, questions about like, why, why aren't birds doing this? Or how can I get birds to, you know, come to my yard or I saw this really interesting um, behavior. What does this mean? And so um, those are just kind of some of the flavors and, and themes I would highlight um, before we get started. Okay, so with that, let's proceed to the first question. So this is from Casey and they ask, I'm seeking identification for this bird spotted on May 17th in San Francisco, California. Well, um, 
I think before diving in, something that we apply to all these, or at least I apply to all of these photos, photo questions, um, which are the ID questions in particular. Um, I think it's important to note the date, obviously the date and the location. Um, you know, someone could be sending, for example, a rough legged hog picture in the middle of summer. Um, and if, if you know about rough legged hawks and you're in the lower, lower 48, for example, it would be relevant to know if that photo was current uh, because those birds should be up in the Arctic or if, if, you know, the photo was from three months prior when it was maybe just migrating north. Um, so for me, that's one of the first things I look at is if we have the, those or that information, uh, which we do here, which is great. So I think our, our form prompts um, prompts the the person that submits a question to to supply the date that the bird was seen and excuse me where that bird was sighted um, so that's that's an easy uh, bit of information that is provided here um, first thing I see is uh, a budio shaped bird um, and so you know that's that's one of the soaring hawks obviously this bird is not soaring as perched in a tree um, but it, it kind of has the characteristics of a, of a Budio species. So um, pretty broad body, um, relatively short-ish tail. You can't really see much of the wings, um, but you can just generally see that the shape fits into what we would classify as a Budio. Um, so what, what do you see, Mike? Uh, just like you, uh, beyond shape, uh, I'd look at the... Uh those uh, very distinctive marks on the wings the the uh, white checkering on the secondaries and then the uh, the rufous breast for sure and then um i think uh, i would bet probably all our participants know what this bird is and that is a, a adult red-shouldered hawk yeah um and we're going to see this as we go through again with these images that are provided uh, I think a couple things to keep in mind. There's a whole spectrum of quality of images, and that that's not a reflection on. In many cases, it's not a reflection on on your ability to take photos. Um, it may just be the bird was far away, the conditions were poor. Maybe you're not, you know, maybe you didn't have the best photography equipment. So those are those things are all okay, and everyone here is probably had one of those things happen um you know you saw a bird fly by and you tried to snap a photo on your phone or whatever it is or your friend sent you a, a kind of poor picture of a bird and you're trying to id it um, those things are all okay um it's okay to admit sometimes you don't have enough information to come to a conclusion and that is the case sometimes um, but we also like when we get really crisp generally pretty good photos like this one um, and that that goes a long way. So there's a whole spectrum um, of of data that comes in, and you know we'll take what we can get. And and the other thing that I'll point out as someone that's submitting a photo for an identification, um, I think it's often underappreciated how much additional just a single additional photo can assist with. You know, if you send one image um, here, this this red shoulder hawk is quite clear. Um, but if you send one image in and it's maybe got a weird angle or something that's not definitive, just one additional frame, even if the bird turns its head or the tail is shaped the other way or turned the other way, even if it's a poor quality photo, some of those things can really lead you to an ID. Um, and so that's often when it's not something as clear as this red shoulder hawk, that's often something that we may um, ask, hey, do you have any more images to share? So don't be afraid. In other words, if you are asking someone about an ID, don't be afraid about the quality of the images or um, how good they are. Just just know that providing all those can really help come come to an ID. So yeah, I agree here. Um, we've got a, a red shoulder talk. Um, anything to add, Steve? No, I like what you said, the more pictures, the better. I think we've all experienced that, you know, Someone takes a picture of us and we're like, that's not me. That doesn't look anything like me. So there's one angle or one whatever, you know. So sometimes, yeah, more more evidence gives us just the piece that we need. So yep, I concur. I would add just just quickly that in our migration sites where we have people that they count professionally, um, there's birds that they can't identify. 
And so we have a column on our data sheet called unidentified raptor or unidentified bootio or occipiter or whatever it might be, but you can't get them all right. And if you have someone that always insists that they know it, what bird it is, um, that might not be realistic. So not, not knowing sometimes is perfectly okay. All right, with that, let's move on to the next one. How crucial for ID are tail bands? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> favorite answer. <laughs> um, I'm sure we all have some thoughts on this. I think the way that I would approach this question is it, it depends on what other information you can provide. It's kind of like like a crime scene almost in my mind. Like you you piece all these things together. So you you, you again have like a location, a time and date, um, maybe even conditions. Um, obviously, geographic, you know, elevation and those kind of things are are helpful. Um, but then then you start getting into you know the sh the shape of the bird, the plumage of the bird, um, characteristics of the bird. And tail bands will certainly fall into those categories. So more more specific things. And sometimes if the bird is, you know, if it's a if it's a, if it's a poor photo again or a dark photo or something or really distant, you may not be able to see the tail. So the tail bands, in addition to those other characteristics, especially shape and plumage, I would say, can probably get you pretty close. If you have those things, you can probably narrow it down to either species or, or very close. For this picture here of this female American kestrel, um, we know that female American kestrels have multiple bands on their tail, um, usually a thicker, more thick band near the tip of the tail, and then additional small black bands. So if you if someone said, hey, I saw this bird and described what I just said, I would probably say, oh, it's probably a female American kestrel. Um, but I would ask other things like, you know, did it have sharp pointy wings? Was it, did it have really quick wing beats? Um, with answers to those questions, that could help you separate something large like a red-tailed hawk or a golden eagle. Um, so those are some of the things that I think of. So in short, it, it again depends, um, but it, it certainly can be a helpful piece of information that can help build your ID. Anybody else? No, I would I would say pretty much the same thing. Um, yeah, just depending on whether field marks you can can see or not see, they could make a difference in distinguishing two similar species. And so, it's great if we have some information, but not every species do we need to see, or every photo do we need to see tail bands to um, to distinguish or the tail in general. You know, for example, I work mostly with golden eagles. Seeing the tails, you know, getting a tail photo is the best thing we can do as far as aging those birds. Um, later, um, so it's great to have something like that. Um, but as far as IDing to species, not always critical. Okay, next question. So this one has accompanying photos on the next slide. So it says, I spotted this large bird in Santa Barbara County at the El Capitan campgrounds in Goleta, if that's the correct pronunciation. This bird was hopping around on one of the beachside lawns. It appeared to be looking for something to snack on. I initially thought it was a hawk, but after watching for about 10 minutes, I noticed large white spots around the neck and wings, maybe an osprey. I've included a few photos and a video. The next day, I spotted the same bird in a cypress tree about half a mile up the coast from my previous sighting. So I'll show you the pictures first. And then I'll show you the video. Hopefully this comes through. I know video can be choppy sometimes on WebEx. And it looks like we have Daphne here with us and they say that it was on April 1st, this sighting. I love this video watching hawks on the ground. It's so funny. <laughs> A bug harvester. Yeah. <laughs> Great video. All right, thoughts, feelings. Do you want me to go back to the photo page? Maybe. I'm um, sure. So th this is representative of a, a lot of the photos that we get. You know, you can you can see body shape on this. You can see the head shape pretty well on the left bird. 
Um, you can see some undertail or maybe some leg markings on the center photo possibly. But the, the first thing that strikes me is shape. And, and there's a saying in bird ID that plumage often lies, but shape never lies. And, and this looks like a bootio to me. Uh, bootio being, you know, red tail family, red shouldered, um, broad wing, although this looks bigger than that. But so, um, yeah, bootio is the first thing that comes to my mind. And then um, then you'd move to some of the markings. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, Jesse? Yeah, um, I agree. Just similar to the first bird we looked at, um, not in that it's necessarily a red shouldered hawk uh, because it's not. Um, but as far as shape goes, it it fits fits the bootio profile. Um, cool behavior. Um, I think behavior is one we haven't really talked about too much in an ID. I, I generally wouldn't just identify a raptor species by a single behavior. I think that's a risky thing because there's you know most in most species overlap in the behaviors they're going to have. Um, but yeah, hunting hunting on the ground looks like it's grabbing some some insects of some sort, which is pretty cool. Um, it looks like it probably. If I saw that, I would initially think maybe the my knee jerk might be, oh, that bird could be injured or something. But it looks like it flew away just fine. Looks like it was doing fine, just just hunting on the ground, which is not super abnormal, but not something you get to see every day. But as far as what what I'm seeing here, um, I agree the overall shape and profile is, is of a bootio. Um, I see the white on the back, which is helpful to kind of get us towards a red-tailed hawk. Um, and a little bit tough in the video to tell the age of the bird. I, I think it's probably an adult um, based on what we can see, but it's, it's pretty distant and a little bit grainy. Um, what do you see, Steve? Anything to add? Yeah, right off the bat, um, seeing the pictures, I, same thing. It just came to the BDO based on kind of the head shape and, and um, the shorter bill compared to something you know, uh, like an osprey, um, which would have a, a more noticeable hook bill and you'd see an eye stripe. So we could eliminate that possibility. Just, uh, you know, the, the location would be, you know, possibly for an osprey, but um, kind of this, the, the wing um, tip length relative to the tail and all these things, yeah, look like a, a, a BDO, a, a, a good size BDO. And red tails are, are so variable that they, yeah, they can present just about any um, plumage. And so they can be the ones that confuse us often when we see, when people comment on, oh, I'm seeing this really different, this or that, and it doesn't seem like anything in the books um, quite regularly, then it will be a red tail because they have such wide variation in their markings. Um, so yeah, that's in a very interesting behavior of yeah, hunting on the ground, like you know, Swainson's hawks, red tails. I mean, all the raptors, as Jesse said, will do this when there's an abundance of insect prey or other things. They'll take advantage of something like this. Even golden eagles have been now recorded, you know, hunting insects on the ground. So yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, I guess to go back slightly on what I said about behavior, like thinking about an osprey, um, it would be unlikely that given that they um, specialize on fish, uh, it would be probably unlikely they'd be jumping around on the grass like this. Nothing's impossible. You never know what they're going after, and certainly they're capable of eating other prey as well. But um, that that would probably be one instance where they are quite quite the specialist, and you could probably safely rule them out in, in this instance, I'd say. Again, unless it was an injured bird, like you originally thought, moving around on the ground. So. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I, I would add that uh, red tails are highly variable, but generally, if you see what looks like backpack straps, white backpack straps on the back of the bird, it's a red tail, as opposed to a red shoulder, which was the first slide we saw, and it was more of a full checkered pattern. Um, this is definitely isn't a red shoulder. So uh, the backpack straps are not really super evident in this photo, but a lot of times that'll be a giveaway. Great. Um, there's lawn mowers outside of my apartment, so apologies. No, we can't. Or... <laughs> That's good. Okay. Let me see. I, really me like, see. I like that we had a video for that one. Thanks for uploading that. That was great. Yeah, that is great. Okay, so our next question is <laughs> my crummy upload is uploaded. My crummy photo is uploaded. What is the best way to ID this hawk pair at such a distance? Location Los Angeles. 
May 2022. This is a good one. What do you say, Mike? Is Julie with us? Sammy? Is she here with us, do you know? There's a Julie in the attendees. I'm not sure if that's... Okay, well, Julie, if, if it is you, um, the first thing I notice on the, the top bird is how big the head is and the overall posture of the bird. And then on the, the bottom bird, how the wings are kind of uh, downswept. And um, my first instinct is uh, these are common ravens, uh, also very dark birds, but um, I could be wrong. What do you guys think? That was my first impression too. And so this is maybe a chance to introduce something too and the term. I don't know how widely it's still used in the bird world, but uh, jizz, just this impression of a bird. It's like, it, sometimes it's hard to put your finger on. It's a combination of characteristics that you see. And so often some of us who've been birding for a long time, we see a bird in the distance, a silhouette flying by. I'm like, oh, that's a flicker. And people are like, well, how did you know that was a flicker just from seeing the silhouette doing this? And sometimes we're very hard pressed to describe why we knew that because we've just seen a lot of these and so yes I, I've, I see a lot of ravens flying around and just the combination of the the two birds posture and the, the way the wings are curved back and the shape and everything else to me um, says Corvid um, right off the bat and I would yeah go with raven as well. And then if, if you watch them long enough and you see one of them fly upside down <laughs> pretty much 100 percent. But they are no, our number one migration site, uh, maybe other than turkey vultures, but ravens will often grab people's attention like, oh, because they'll, they'll, they'll soar like hawks sometimes and circle and do all kinds of things. And so they can definitely yeah, throw you for a loop. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they're, the, the acronym you use, Steve, just uh, I think it's general impression of shape and size, um, I think is what it stands for. At least that's what I remember um so that that is all we have to go off of here you know we don't have any besides it being dark which in this case i think is correctly representing what we're seeing um it could be representative of like a poorly exposed photo um but i think in, in this case given all the other other things we're seeing that long you can't really see the wedge-shaped tail too much but kind of the weak droopy wings relative to a raptor um long longer head and and just the general shape and two of them together uh, which fall into the shape and impression and at, at a distance uh, i think yeah definitely definitely fits uh for raven common raven do you have any other um maybe tips for iding hawk silhouettes up in the sky or resources to direct people to yeah that certainly um I mean, the, I think I have one of them here. Okay. I got one. Desk. Um, oh yeah, we have both of them. Steve has one and I have the other one right here. So these two books that we're holding up, even though it's backward, um, this one is Hawks at a Distance. Hard to read backwards. And Steve has the other one that's- um, Hawks from Every Angle. From Every Angle. Uh, both authored by our, our friend, Jerry Liguori. Um, those are jokingly referred to as kind of the hawk watching Bibles. Um, as far as identifying raptors in North America in flight, uh, certainly a lot of what you can learn in those books would apply to out of North America too, and, and some of the species overlap too, obviously. Um, but just just the tips and techniques and approach to identifying birds in flight, um, those two books are specifically made as identification books for birds flying, um, which is a pretty pretty unique ID tool um, amongst ID tools. And then the other one is the Raptor ID app, which is Hawkwatch's app. There, Mike's showing it. Try going a little closer, Mike. If you go close, I think it'll fix the, the lighting. Go down a little bit. Right there. So you'll recognize that. You can get that on the iPhone store. What What is it called? I'm not an iPhone person. Oh, the app, app store and then Google Play, I think it is. <laughs> app store and then Google Play. Uh, it's a free app. Um, and if you're into Raptor identification and want to learn more. Um, there's high quality videos. Actually, some of the photos in those books are in the app as well. Um, and there's some narration kind of talking through the videos. So there won't be common ravens, but it would be similar to this in that a bird would be flying by 
and it'll be narrated kind of telling you this is you know what we're looking at when you see that bird and so those are those are great tips um and and tools of the trade hmm. we also sell those books on our website if you're interested so our next question is also from joy that she's been observing a red-tailed hawk nest there was originally a male and a female, but I have not seen the two adult hawks since I have been able to spot the chick, now an adolescent who is branching. Is it typical for dad to stay around, or is it likely he has left? Once the adolescent leaves the nest, is there a continued connection with the parents? Outside of the meeting, mating season, does the couple stay together? I see how these are the questions I really like. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot there, but, um, you know, just kind of going through the question in order. Um, yeah, as these, you know, with all raptors, um, once you have chicks, there becomes, there's this energy demand um, to bring in food. And so you're unlikely to see both adults at the nest once you have hatched young because they're demanding food. And so one of the adults is gonna be out hunting almost all the time um, and then as the nestings get even larger and they're able to thermoregulate they don't need one of the adults to to shelter them to brood them and keep them warm you may have both adults gone um, that's risky um, you know another bird or predator could come in and take the nestlings but you will have that um, in some cases where both adults have to go off and hunt and the nestlings are left alone and this is one of these cases where Sometimes we get people calling meaning well and, and trying to intervene because I just, there's nestlings by themselves. We don't see the adults or or something like that. And so it's not uncommon to have, again, um, just one adult or none of the neither of the adults present as the chicks age. Um, and yeah, um, if one, it, it, you know, it's also possible that one of the adults does die during the nesting season. Quite often if that happens, unfortunately, they'll, you know, the nest won't make it. Um, there's been some, now, with all the cameras we have in different nests around the country, you know, sometimes, you know, a single bird is able to pull it off. But it's it's a big lift for a bird to bring in enough food and take care of the young by themselves. And so very likely both are present, um, just not at the same time. Um, uh, once the young sleep in the nest, they'll typically be associated with the parents still for some time. They learn from the parents, you know, they'll they'll be in, you know, the, tr the tree or the cliff or, you know, depending on the species for a while near the nest um, and, and learn from the parents and still might be brought some food even when they're free flying. Um, and in a lot of raptors, they'll stick around the parents um, for, uh, you know, a month or more post fledging before they, you know, migrate. Um, if they are a migratory species or in an area where they migrate, you know, again, with red tails, depending on where you're at, and they may stick around all year round um, or have some migration. Um, and a lot of raptors, they do um, have, uh, once, you know, a pair bond will last until one of them dies. And, and so they will, um, you know, continue to nest together year after year. Um, so. Anything to add before I move on? That was great. Beautiful. Okay. This is from Lucille. I'm looking for the ID and age of the photo of the raptor in the photos taken in southeastern Arizona mid April. Um, since I am down in southeastern Arizona right now, and it's, well, it's mid May, but um, that's a bird that just showed up um, on the landscape here just about a month ago when she took this picture. They started migrating through from Argentina on their way north, and uh, that is an adult Swainson's hawk, a really pretty bird, too. Nice picture. Great. I mean, if you open the submission on our end, this is the kind of picture that you would, you know, you love to see because they make it pretty easy. It's all right there. Are there any field markers that would lead you to Swainson's? Um, the, from at least from this view, uh, the most common one is it's called headlight, and that's the the white feathers around the um, around the bill and on the throat. Uh, that's that's a very common Swainson's uh, field mark, and then you can see the beautiful Rufus bib on, on this bird. This is a light morph bird. Um, 
And then the grayish, ca grayish cast to the feathers, that, that's a very Swainson-ish thing. <laughs> but it's, it's in the Budio family, like red shoulders, red tails. Um, so the same kind of shape, a little more slender. And when, when you see it in the sky, it's, <laughs> its wings are a lot more slender. But um, same basic family and um, just very crisp, clean bird. That's a really pretty bird. Yeah, there, it's it's tough to see some of the things here. Another one is the bib on the right photo. Um, so a, a light, even the dark morph birds will have a bib as well. But you can see the bib underneath the kind of the throat area, um, up above the breast. That's pretty typical, and of a of an adult that's going to stand out like this. Um, Swainsons have really a long long wings, uh, which is helpful for them given they're migrating so far. So again, that's tricky to see at these angles but if you could see more of the tail and the wingtips that the wingtips would actually extend kind of beyond um, the tail which is helpful uh, in this posture um, the legs aren't feathered so you can rule out a ferruginous hawk pretty easily um, if a ferruginous hawk plumage looked like this that would be noteworthy as well um, but but you can look here and, and see that this doesn't fit into that group. Um, so we know, again, the location, we know it's Arizona mid, mid April. So our list of Budio species, once you get that narrowed down is, is, you know, red tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, you could have something like a short tailed hawk. That'd be pretty remarkable. Uh, obviously a gray hawk, um, a, a common black hawk is another option, but those would all, those last few would be pretty good birds and don't really look at all like this. Um, Maybe you get lucky and see a broad winged hawk flying through, but A, it wouldn't look like this, and, and B, it'd be pretty remarkable to be perched nonetheless on a telephone pole. Uh, that would be fairly exceptional. So really, without much additional information beyond, again, the, the location and timing, uh, with a little background research on, on what could be there, if you can get it to Budio, you can pretty much rule out anything but a red-tailed hawk and a Swainson's hawk in my mind. I mean, it's it's a very clear Swainson's hawk. Uh, if you happen to see this bird uh, in the sky rather than perched, uh, a real easy field mark for Swainson's are the color of the flight feathers, the primaries and secondaries. They're, they're very dark compared to other Budios. So I always think black and back. If I see black or dark flight feathers, even quickly, um, I know it's a Swainson's. So black and back is kind of one of my, my little keys for this bird of in flight. So we have a raptor ambassador, Aurora, who is a Swainson's hawk, and they are a dark morph. So they're pretty much entirely dark brown. Um, would you use kind of the location and then the silhouette to ID a dark morph Swainson, or are there other things to look at like if the dark if this bird had the same posture and everything and was dark or yes like not in flight if it was a perch dark more yeah i mean it would be probably a little easier to confuse with a, a dark red tail because they there can be a lot of overlap and um you know there's been many conversation amongst folks like us that that have an image like that and it's like geez is this a red tailed hawk or a swainson's hawk i would be confident that we could narrow that down with with an image with this high quality um you know the just just some of the fine characteristics again of um the the shape and we would probably still be able to see a little bit of a bib i imagine um maybe uh, just kind of the structure of the face would look a little bit different and, and more of a swainson's hawk than a, a red-tailed hawk but it but it would increase the difficulty i'd say Okay, um, so we have a question from Francisco. Can you tell the difference between sexes and raptors and more specifically peregrine falcons? Um, if you, you can if you have a scale and a, and a ruler and a leg gauge and the bird is in your hand, you can definitely tell the difference. And have the bird in hand. <laughs> yes. Um, Pretty, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, they look the same, males and females. Yeah, there's no clear 
differentiation, clear way to differentiate them, um, especially if you just have one individual. You know, if you have a pair, a known nesting pair, and they're flying or perched next to each other, uh, you could probably be quite com like very confident. It would be quite obvious that the female is much larger um, in in most all of the raptors that we're talking about uh, in North America. You could be generally quite confident if you have a pair, the larger one's going to be the female. Um, but beyond that, unless you're looking at a species that's dimorphic by plumage, like American kestrel or an adult um, set of harriers where you've got a gray male harrier and a, and a brownish female harrier. Um, nothing besides some very subtle things which aren't dependable, nothing's gonna allow you to, to say that's a male or a female um, besides size if you saw them next to each other. Anything to add, Steve? No, I was just muting because here's my kids in the next room but um uh no i mean yeah it's in some species we can it, if we're lucky you know again i work mostly with golden eagles and sometimes if you're lucky enough to have them both uh, on the nest next to each other you can tell the size difference and say oh that's the female um but there, again there's variability in the range of sizes of males and the range of sizes of females so there can be overlap where it's very difficult but but yes as jesse said for most a lot of raptors, we have what's called sexual dimorphism, where the female is larger, and that's presumably because, you know, they have to carry, you know, they have to develop this egg, and and the, and it also provides maybe some partitioning and, and hunting of resources, and the female protecting the nest. There's all kinds of theories, um, none of them necessarily proven, that just our, our, um, our conjecture about why the female is, is larger in, in some cases. So, and then, you know, some species are very distinct in their markings by male and female, but most of them are not, so. Uh, lastly, if, if you're lucky enough to see bird sex, um, the male is on top, but you have, you have to look quickly because it doesn't last very long. <laughs> very true. <laughs> okay, so that is all that I have as of 2 p.m. today, I'm seeing that Jen in the chat sent another question in. Um, I was gonna say, Jen, if you want to, oh, Jen is actually leaving. So if anybody has any questions, pop them in the chat now. I wanna make sure that we get to your questions before we go back through some other ask an expert questions we've received through the form that I pulled out. So. Um, I see we have one from Willie Hall, who says, I have monitored two peregrine falcon nests for five years in the Yuba River Canyon of California. I keep notes each year, and one thing stands out. The results from the nest varies a lot, from no success after egg laying to four-fledged and everything in between. Is this typical of falcons or raptors in general? Mm, yeah, um, so again, you know, I feel like maybe I, I pull on the eagles too much, but um, I, I've spent many, many years watching golden eagle nests, uh, a lot of different nests across parts of Utah, and yeah, very similar type of situation. We can have we can have territories right next to each other in similar habitat where you know one nest fails, the other one doesn't, um, it has two young that year, and um, sometimes you have three young that very rarely make it that far, but typically it's just one, and so. Quite a bit of variability and then from year to year just depending on you know what the winter conditions were like going into the nesting season which affects the condition of the the breeding pair and whether they decide to lay eggs and then once they do make that decision you know there's all kinds of you know weather events that can happen that influence whether you know they fail if the prey is abundant if they're spending too much time away from the nest because there's not enough prey and Maybe the eggs don't get incubated or that they, they give up on the nesting or or other things like that. So there's all kinds of factors. It's it's for raptors, um, one of their, you know, the, one of their advantages, obviously their large size and long-lived nature as as predators, but a flip side of that is they have a, a fairly long nesting season um, from start to finish compared to other birds. So there's a lot that can go wrong in that um, long, long incubation and then the long um Nest, nestling to fledge period um, from, you know, it could be months, months on, you know, 
very many months for eagles you know, and even for peregrines it's going to be uh, probably a, about a month of incubation and then close to a month before they fledge so yeah that's a long time for things to go to go wrong and lots of variability as a result oops um so i do have another question that was submitted through the ask an expert form and i think you honestly might be able to id it if i show you the photo through my phone which i know is not great but i want to make sure that we get this question in um so Jen submitted a picture and she said, I think this is a falcon, but its tail looks like a red tail. I saw this bird flying in Dry Canyon, Linden, Utah in April. So I know this is tough, but if you can't ID it, I could do it for you. But <laughs> That's a male American kestrel. And it is a falcon. So mm -hmm. why yeah, do you think um, that? Yeah, if you yeah, it is good enough just holding it there. Um I can see, well, lots of things. Sharp little pointy wings. Um, we see what we call a string of pearls, which is the white dots that you can see on the trailing edge of the wings, uh, which is pretty apparent, uh, specifically on males. Uh, females can also have something similar, but it's not as striking. The, the image, or, or maybe it's just because we're going through multiple cameras here, um, it's a little dark, um, but I, I can still see that the wings have kind of a slaty blue on them, uh, which I know a male kestrel should have has a kind of a plain brownish uh, tan tail with a thick black tip and a, a white terminal edge to it, which is classic American kestrel. Um, so looks like a great image. Um, everything we need to, to not only get American kestrel, but um, a male. So again, this, this is one of the few species we have that is identifiable down to sex. So we, we can specifically say that's a, a male individual. Anything to add? Thanks, Sammy. No problem. <laughs> Sorry about the. No, it's great. The janky nature. <laughs> those are those are fun ones. Yeah. Nice, nice photos that are helpful. Um. So I have another question from Lucille, who lives in Florida. Um, where should they go to see golden eagles without climbing two miles upward? Um. She's in her late seventies, and she wants to learn more about them after reading how they were hunted from aircraft in Texas in the Guadalupe Mountains. Hmm. Like an interesting. Well, I'm curious about that last part. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that, um, so I would like to learn more about um, this story and and what they've learned there. I'd be really curious to to know more about that myself. Um, I mean, seeing golden eagles in Florida is not impossible, but it's more challenging, obviously, than out where we are here in, in the West. Um, there there are eastern golden eagles, but they're at fairly low abundance and can be challenging to see. Um, you know, if I were trying to go see, if, I, if, I'm try, if I were trying to go see a particular raptor in any area, I would, you know, use the local resources to, 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 to put myself in the the right potential area to do so. Um, it doesn't ever guarantee success, um, but um, you know you can use, you can go on to eBird and you can compile sightings by period, and you can you know see people checklists, and you can get in touch with other birders in the area um, for for pointers like that on on where to to have the most success and when to go to go try to do something like that. So I have a question from John. Hi, John. Thank you for sending me photos recently. Um, but John asks, do hey, we John. know what <laughs> John asks, do we know what determines a mating pair returning to the nest they have used for a few years when the male or female of a mating pair dies? That's another fun one. Yeah. Go well, for it. I yeah, no, I was going to say, I, you know, th that's a really, I mean, it's a great question. I think I would even back up and say we don't even necessarily know what determines when a pair without a death, you know, will use the same nest from year to year. There is nest switching that occurs naturally. And again, there's all kinds of interesting theories, some of which uh, raptors are raptors are so low abundance and low density and they, they make really interesting but difficult study species you know it's hard to get enough sample sizes to understand some things um you know again 
for Golden Eagles, we've been we've tracked hundreds of, of uh, territories across many decades, and we've looked at nest switching. Like, oh, why did they in a territory they've got three nests? Why did they choose to use the same nest? You know, every year that they decided to nest because they don't nest every year, and then suddenly the fifth year they switch to nest B, uh, and then you know they use that one for a little bit. And so there's theories about parasites that build up in the nest because there are all these dead things laying in the nest. Um, you know, there's theories that if they fail, that that's just kind of a trigger that they're going to move to another nest. Maybe it's a disturbance that happens that's going to make them want to to choose a different nest. So there's all kinds of there's all kinds of again speculation and theories that biologists feel like these are likely some of the contributors of why birds choose to switch nests. Um, you know, some species have one prominent nest they use every year um, for the most part, and they're very they have pretty good fidelity to that nest. Um, some species play what's called the shell game, where they have more nests and maybe they move around. Phrygianus hawks that just they spend a lot of time with, they're pretty famous for having sometimes many different nests across the landscape. And it's believed that that helps them avoid predators by just kind of you know, changing up what they're doing. And so there's a lot to be learned still about why they, you know, raptors choose to switch between nests. From what I've seen, again, with a lot of studying of golden eagles, that when it seems like a, an adult is lost in a, a in a territory, it takes it takes a few years before um, the remaining adult finds a mate, um, and and then um, we've actually had a few nests a, a nest where we had a camera situation, and, and then even when they did a new female came in, they weren't successful for a few years. Just you know, like figuring things out together, um, uh, not necessarily surprising. And so I, I I would assume it's probably similar in some of the other species too. I just add. Um... And this is somewhat common sense, but it's if if that nest, if you can confirm that one of the mates actually does die, um, and the territory is occupied again, I mean that's a really good indication that things are probably pretty good there, meaning that there's somebody that's waiting to get in and replace that individual that passed away. Um, so that beyond those individual birds, that can be pretty and pretty telling about how productive and useful and, and good that habitat is for that particular pair of raptors. Um, so there's a lot more you can glean from, you know, switching from year to year to year and dynamics between what individuals are there and not and, and how they move um, based on what you see. Great. Okay. So for the last 10 minutes, I think we'll try to do a little bit of a speed round. I've picked some questions from the Ask an Expert form that people said they were okay with us sharing. Um, so our experts should have seen these ones before. So hopefully we can kind of buzz through in the last 10 minutes. So we have a question that says, I chose to just enjoy the bird's flight rather than try to get a photo, which I now regret. It was a raptor of average size, smaller than an eagle, flying over my hayfield. I, it had a white underbelly with distinctive dark blackish tip wings. I cannot find a raptor description to fit any idea what species this might be. They also included their location, but I forgot to put it in here. So <laughs> I believe it was Minnesota okay. and this came in recently and, and this was actually, I, I love this question. Um, so I teased her or it could have been him. Uh, I'm assuming Lynn was female, but so it, my answer was, was teasing and that Oh, you mean you just stood out there and watched the bird over your hayfield instead of running in your house and getting your camera and fumbling with all the adjustments and making sure you had batteries and trying to get it in focus. And then you mean you just stood there and actually admired a bird flying over? Kudos to you. Um, and then taking the information that she gave us, um, I sent two pictures off of our app. One was a red-tailed hawk, only because it's so common that it's very possible it could have been a red tail. But the other one I sent was a, a male northern harrier, because that seemed to fit her color description. And also a, a male northern harrier would be very comfortable over her, her hay field. Looking at uh, data on eBird, uh, her location was very close to riparian area, which harriers favor. So anyways, I sent the two pictures back and she said, bingo, it's a, it was a male Northern Harrier. It was a, or a gray ghost, if, if you want to call it that. Um, so that, that was a, a fun one because we didn't have much information to work with. 
Right. And she did not seem to mind the teasing at all. Yeah. And I'll just add, this is the question I get most often at social events and parties from people who know I work at a place called Hawk Watch. Like, oh, I saw a bird and they give me a verbal description and then I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> it is it is fun, but it, you know, because it's often you can go to like, well, where were you? What time of day was it? What did you see? And 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 make some, you know, you know, narrow things down a little bit for them. But yeah. All right. What species is this goshawk located in Bealesville, Maryland? Uh, yeah, this is another one that came in. This was this one's a tricky one. Um, I think a few of us discussed this one, and we arrived at Cooper's Hawk. Um, you know, it's it's a really tough angle, um, but we factored a few things in. Just the shape of the bird that we can see. Um, it's kind of a grayer individual, so it's probably an older bird, as in not a not a juvenile plumage. Um, looks like you can kind of see a cap on the head. The head's kind of turned, um, and it's carrying something. I think, which I. I can't make out what it is. It almost looks like a distorted, like, squirrel head, <laughs> upside hanging upside down, which is totally possible, and and would be a legitimate prey item for either a cooper sock or a, a gossock. Uh, but we, then we factored in location as well. Um, be fairly rare, quite quite rare to see a gossock moving through this area of Maryland. Um, although that's a good reminder that you shouldn't just rule anything out based on location. Um, we all know that there's individuals that can show up anywhere. And these birds can fly, and so you could see you could see them where you least expect them. But I think all all things combined, um, also you can see the undertail coverts, which wouldn't help us too much with an older bird. Um, if it's a juvenile goshawk, they'd be they'd be marked. Um, but everything here leads me to believe Cooper's hawk. I think that's what me and Mike, when we talked about it, kind of agreed on. We also sent this picture to uh, one of our lead counters, uh, our migration counters, and uh, he had he said the same thing. He goes, "I'm not sure, but uh, I'm leaning hard towards Cooper's hawk." So the four people that looked at it all kind of had that same gestalt thing, and um, that's uh, he actually emailed back the the photographer and said, "Yeah, I thought it was a coop, but I was just hoping for a goss." Oh, yeah. That's another common thing we get. So. And again, it's natural um, wanting to see something a little bit different or exciting, and and so sometimes reaching. Um, I think I think we here are also guilty of it on this panel that you know you, I, I've looked at things and wanted to turn them into something else for a long time. You know, staring at it. So. So before we get to this question, I want to answer one in the chat, which is where is the best place for me to find and observe a ferruginous hawk in Salt Lake City, Utah? Hopefully, Darkmore. Well, that's got to be Jesse's question. <laughs> uh, well, if I were to answer the question like the way it's phrased in Salt Lake City, the best place would be at the airport. Um, that would be pretty unlikely, but you they definitely have dark, more fruginous hawks and fruginous hawks that they capture at the airport and relocate. Um, the SLC International Airport actually has a really good relocation program um, and so lots of raptors because the habitat is so good there um, it'd be much less likely right now because the birds would be breeding at least ad adults would be um, and i see that you say around salt lake is fine i was i was teasing a little bit um, probably my top suggestion would be maybe the skull valley um, steve might have some some feedback there but like if you go out towards dugway Proving grounds and, and drive that road out there. Um, we often see ferruginous hawks during the summer, perched on those telephone poles. I think there's usually a few pairs out that way. And, and Steve's been out there recently. He may have seen something. Um, yeah, so that, almost every time I drive that road, I see at least one. Not not usually dark morphs. They're you know yeah. less common to see, but you know if you put some time in, you would have pretty good good chances. Yeah, as far as quote unquote local, um, I think those would be your best bet. Obviously, if you did that same drive in the winter um, or went to like Snowville up in Northern Utah, um, very good chance you could drive to Snowville and drive around on those roads west of the highway during the winter time and um, see fru multiple fruginous hawks and probably a dark morph. So that, those would be my suggestions. 
for many years, there was a pair of dark morphs that uh, um, they were a pair at the uh, northern end of the Cedar Mountains, just off of uh, I-80. And they would have light kids, they would have dark kids, they were, uh, but it was interesting seeing two dark parents. And uh, that, that was probably five or six years ago, but they were, they were pretty regular. Uh, it's a good chance they're, they're no longer there though. Okay, so I think we have time for maybe one more question. So this one is from William and they ask, the fall migration of raptors in my area, Blue Ridge Mountains is typically September. Does the phase of the moon have any effect on migration? We are trying to pick a week with the best chance of large numbers. That's a tough, that's a really great question. Um, curious to hear what others think. I, I, I don't know a great answer. I, was, I, don't, I, probably, I don't know if I responded to this one. I'm trying to remember, did I yeah, like my I, response to this? I'm not sure um, if we responded to this one yet. So if, if uh, William is here, apologies for not responding um, yet. Yeah. I mean, my thoughts just reading the question are, I mean, your best bet is to to use the information which exists in spades for the East on migration timing in general. And depending on what species you really want to see, you look at that bell curve and you go sometime in that that key week uh, kind of, and then you factor in weather. You know, having a weather event can can you know push birds can stop birds if there's a big storm coming and then you can have a big push after the weather um i, I don't really personally think the moon phase is going to play a large role it might it'd be awesome if you're camping up there obviously if you have a full moon a full moon can affect migration of songbirds which maybe drives some of the um you know songbird hunting raptors and their migration patterns but um for the most part um I know there's been a few papers where people have tried to look at different things like you know weather and, and phase of moon and things like that. And I think there's even one publication that specifically mentions the phase of moon and just not there's not really strong relationships there. It's really going to be driven by kind of the typical annual, you know, the food resources are less abundant and the birds are going to come through and they're going to follow those typical um, times of year with some little variation based on you know, micro conditions and weather and so on. Yeah, I'll just add, I think uh, from what most of what we know, I mean, the birds it seems like you're after as far as counting are diurnal raptors. Um, there's there's some evidence that some of these individuals can move at night as well, but the majority are probably migrating during the day um, based on what we know about how they're using the, you know, thermals and whatnot that are created when the sun is out. Um, and so, I can't imagine the moon has much effect on that. Uh, I know for some nocturnal species like um, northern saw what else, you know, they they have shown that there's like lower capture rates when it's a bright moon out. Whether that means the bird's not moving because the sun the moon's out, or maybe the bird can just see the nets. Uh, but as far as migrating, I can't imagine it. It affects these individuals during the day all that much. All right, I'm just gonna do one more just because. Okay. Oh, that's do a nice we wanna, one. Do we want a picture one or do we want a, a text one? What are we thinking? Well, we can do this one really quickly. Uh, that's a Cooper's hawk. It's banded, by the way. Um, yeah. But what makes it a coop is those nice, clean, crisp streaks. It's a juvenile coop. Um, you can see the eye is just starting to turn orange, so it's probably uh, you know it's it's starting to age, obviously. Uh, also, the wedgy head, but it's the clean, crisp breast streaks. As opposed to a sharpie, which are a lot more blobby, uh, that that's what makes this a coop. Great. Um, let's do let's do our last question, which is: This person has three dogs, a six month year old pug who weighs you're covering it fourteen pounds, two pomeranians who weigh around fifteen to twenty. They have hawks in their neighborhood. There's plenty of other food sources around, but are they at risk? of their dogs being munched. <laughs> yeah, this is this is not an unusual question. And we've had, you know, people uh, have asked this over the years uh, many times. And um, so, you know, it's not without um, possibility that a raptor could take uh, a, a pet cat or dog of the sizes described here. 
Um, if there's a lot of other food, it's unlikely. And depending on your your situation where you are, like if your if your yard is you know um, fairly busy area with lots of human activity around, the the likelihood of raptors coming into your yard and and doing something like this are are not super super high. Um, especially if you're with the animals in the yard, you're not going to likely see that. And so. Um, you know, it's it's not inconceivable, but highly unlikely um, uh, to to happen. Um, yes, I I know there's even a few companies that are um, I don't know want to use the term capitalizing, but they are tapping into this concern uh, from pet owners where they make vests that have different spikes or patterns to try to deter. Um, and a few years ago, a woman from New York. Um, uh basically inform me about this uh, availability of these things and um so yeah you know it, you you need to do what you feel comfortable with to, to to make your animals safe but um i personally wouldn't feel overly concerned based on uh, kind of the situation and area you're just you're in it seems pretty unlikely um yeah what about other pets like cats or maybe even chickens things like yeah that. i mean it does it does happen you know we do here in salt lake we have you know lots of cooper's hawks and people with backyard chickens and so we do have people who have issues with chickens being taken um, by cooper's hawks or other raptors um so yeah that's definitely a, a, a real possibility um for something like that more common um possibly um any thoughts from others I think you summed it up, summed up nicely. I mean, anything can happen. You never want to say never, um, but your pets are generally probably safe. And then if you have game birds or or fowl, I guess you'd want to just keep a net over them. Um, but beyond that, you know, have a nice run for them to have have some space to safely move around. Um, but yeah, that's my my main advice. And I will just, you know, I guess maybe I'll add to it is that we have received lots of questions of this nature, but we've never received people reporting that it's actually happened. So maybe that you weigh that in there a little bit too. It's a, it's a yeah. common, it's a common concern, but we don't have actual documentation from people saying, oh my gosh, I saw this happen um, to my pet. Other than the chicken thing, which we do, I, obviously I've had people send pictures of Cooper's hawks sitting on chicken in their yard and other things that does happen um, with some frequency all righty well thank you so much to everyone for submitting your questions and thank you jesse steve and mike for doing such a great job i hope everybody had fun um so yeah i think that's a wrap thank you everyone for joining us thanks everybody okay thank you have a good one <laughs> see ya see ya